like now to uh, welcome a uh, long-term colleague and friend, Dr. Giovanni Frisoni. Giovanni, it's hard to describe your career, but just let me see you. Let me say that you are a globally recognized expert in amyloid imaging, acute diagnosis, targeted therapy, um, and but you're also working on the patient's life by working on recommendations and approaches to definitely and efficiently implement the latest research, make them available to the patients to have them the best treatment. Let me come to my first um, question. You are today you are directing a memory clinic and interact daily with people who are living with dementia and their families. Can you briefly describe the journey from a clinician's perspective and the challenges you face on a daily basis? Sure. Uh, in memory clinics, patients go through an interview with an MD or a psychologist. Then they undergo a neurological exam with an MD specialist and then move on to a detailed, detailed test of memory and other functions, brain MRI, and sometimes uh, more advanced tests such as lumbar puncture, PET, brain PET, or brain SPECT scan. Uh, what I perceive as a challenge in my daily work, uh, however, is not the technical part, but communication and the emotional part. What is challenging is not explaining how a lumbar puncture is performed, but overcoming the cultural stereotypes and the historical fears associated with lumbar puncture. It's not explaining what a neuropsychological battery consists of, but making people overcome the frustration of doing mistakes during the tests. It's not explaining how an MR scanner works, but having claustrophobic people overcome the fear of being trapped in a tube. But if you allow me an even tougher challenge is teaching people to see, hear, smell, feel, fear, and enjoy the world like a patient with Alzheimer's. Because mm -hmm. the vast majority of people with Alzheimer's can enjoy life, provided someone gives reassurance Practical support, not too little, not too much. And the bubble, emotional closeness. Uh, understanding this helps patients and family discover a new way of, enjoy li of enjoying life. It, it's not easy, I admit, but it can be done. And I've seen it done a number of times. Yeah, thank you so much. Me too. And I'm looking forward to what Rebecca will tell us later about her experience. Now, um, since we have a sort of changing environment, we have now disease modifying treatments available. So more and more people might consider diagnosis. So what advice would you give to someone who is considering a diagnosis either for themselves or for family members? What do they have to prepare for? Well, of course, seek a most competent specialist, someone who manages the most advanced technology, but most of all, do not do it alone. Make sure that you're accompanied by someone whom you love and trust and who loves and value you. And uh, if there is no one with these characteristics in your life, you may wish to choose the person closest to this description or to try or try and fix once and for all some broken relationship that oftentimes grow by living together with someone. Uh, people should remember that when you have Alzheimer's, you badly need someone who really cares for you. This would be my uh, most, uh, my warmest advice to people. Yeah, how, how true this is. Um, um, are there differences between men and women when they see you, uh, the way how we approach you, uh, the way how we cope with a, with a dementia diagnosis? Yes, well, what I've most often observed in my clinical practice is that women much more often than men are concerned about being a weight to the family, to their family. I've heard much more often from women than men sentences like, if I have Alzheimer's, I will opt in for euthanasia. Or 
I do not want my kids to know that I have Alzheimer's as this would be too hard on them. Or I'd rather go to a nursing home rather than be a burden to my family. One can make a number of hypotheses why this is the case, but I believe that cultural norms and habits may play a role. In Western and many non-Western societies, women are generally those who give help, while men, I'm one of those, are generally those who receive help. And I find this uh, women's attitude to, to diagnosis thought-provoking, but also, if you allow me, deeply moving. So um, if you have a woman in front of you um, with all the caring aspects about the family um, and not being a burden, what advice do you give her? Well, again, if you have, if you as a woman, if you have someone whom, with whom you have uh, shared your life, with whom you have shared your fears, anguish, your hopes for the future, and someone who really cares for you, you share this moment. This is going to be a life-changing moment. Don't do it alone. You can change the, we will change the way you see life, the way you enjoy life, but it's a different way of enjoying. It's the way of enjoying life will need someone who will be helping you, who will be a crutch. We usually do not need a crutch to, to enjoy life uh, when we don't have Alzheimer's. When, when we have Alzheimer's, we need a crutch, but with a crutch, and I'm meaning someone to help you uh, uh, in, in your daily life, life can be enjoyed as uh, without Alzheimer's, sometimes even more because you can discover some facets of a person that were hidden by cultural norms, by the rules, by the, by the work, uh, by the way one has to behave. Yeah. Yeah, and I have I have I have seen this actually um, in in trans families. I people enjoy life, but they need the help, and we should come back to that with Rebecca. Um, the good news is um, that recently, um, November and now May, um, two treatments for Alzheimer disease modifying treatments, which can really slow down the progression of the disease, have been significantly um, identified significant changes. So there is definitely a hope that in early Alzheimer, we can delay the progression. So how will this approvals, which we are expecting very soon, um, change the clinical practice and when? Well, uh, actually this is the time I've been looking for for the past uh, 30 something years. Uh, till now, we had drugs which were like aspirin from pneumo for pneumonia. Now we have what antibiotics are to pneumonia. We have drugs acting on the very causal core of Alzheimer's. And these drugs will, will radically transform not only the way we treat patients, but first and foremost, the way we think of the disease. They will change the societal narrative of Alzheimer's which will be finally one of a condition that is not due to aging, but it's merely associated with aging. It's something that takes place at a given age, which is older age, but it's not like aging. It's not a matter of semantics. There's a world of a difference. And these drugs will also gradually take away the stigma of a disease that deprives you of the very core of what means being human and cannot be cured because now it will be curable. But maybe even more important, they will pave the way to secondary prevention. What, what do I mean by that? We are on our way to turn Alzheimer's into not only a curable disease, which is already something huge, but also a preventable one. 
we're working to develop the second generation memory clinics where Alzheimer's will be prevented in persons, in persons with normal, in persons of my age, of your age, Andrea, but at high risk, rather than as we do now, delaying the progression of memory impairment once memory impairment is already there. Yeah, as you well know, this is one of my um, biggest uh, preoccupation to actually go to this prevention phase, because as we know, um, you cannot replace uh, brain cells. You need to, in fact, uh, uh, prevent that we are dying. So this is really where we need to go. We need to prevent that the brain structure and the brain health is um, being affected by this disease. So this is really where we are going. And I'm so happy that you are uh, believing this as much as I do. Now, let me come to the last question. I mean, in particular in Europe, um, are we actually ready to take these new drugs on? Do we have the infrastructure or what needs to happen so that you can make this available to patients? Yes, there's a number of uh, changes that will need to take place also in the minds of, uh, of physicians. Well, first, we should resist the temptation. We, as a, as a specialist, we should resist the temptation to offer, offer, to offer the drug to as many patients as possible and start treating those relatively few patients who are closer to the clinical trial population where the drugs have been shown to be effective and more tolerated. We should treat the patients when there is a real indication to treatment. This will let uh, us, specialists, build familiarity with these new technological tools. Drugs are technological tools, after, after all, and will give society a reassuring message of caution that we're not, we do not want to treat anyone who has memory problems, but only those who can benefit most. The infrastructure, well, the infrastructure is not ready, we should gradually expand the, the capability of memory clinics to, to offer perfusions and uh, uh, close follow-ups every month or every two weeks even. And the future of memory clinics uh, uh, will be similar to clinics for multiple sclerosis or cancer, where patients come often in the first months of treatment and later on, uh, probably less frequently. Then you've mentioned reimbursement. Well, as to reimbursement, I suspect that visions may differ significantly between the EU and US. As a European, I believe that reimbursement is not a clinical decision. It's a political decision taken by politicians on behalf of the whole society. Uh, what we as a specialist should, should do is to work with patient advocates, uh, patient advocates in society at large to honestly and transparently identify the patient who can benefit the most, quantify this benefit, estimate the potential number of candidates for treatment, and feed this information to politicians. This is the information that politicians need to make simulation of the cost to society. And this is what we as specialists and uh, together with patients, we should do to allow politicians make informed decisions. 